instructions. Uh, so, okay, this is uh, what to expect. It's going to be an open forum. Uh, we have a uh, good friend of mine, a civil attorney, and we have a guy who's a prosecutor. And we're going to, we tried to have a criminal defense attorney up here, Jennifer, but she kind of disappeared. Her yeah, I guess she was afraid She's of you right. guys. So if you, have to make, if you two would like to make a statement or... Sure. Hello. Want that? My name. <laughs> that was good, huh? All right. Yes, I've complained about the air conditioning again. I'm happy to see so many of the people that I work with here in the audience. I could have a 100% success rate in spotting the Fed. So anybody who wants to talk with me after, if you need a t-shirt, let me know. Maybe we can work something out because you can run, but you cannot hide. Bring it down. Nice to see you again. <laughs> I'm going to go hunt for Jennifer. I'm a federal prosecutor from San Diego, California. My name is Mitch Dembin. And I, Peter asked me to do this, and I agreed because I thought it made sense to do a little bit of reality checking. Um, talk about what we really prosecute versus what people think we prosecute, and kind of give some people a comfort level. And the reason I'm willing to do that is, you know, we talk a lot about what's legal and what's illegal. And a lot of the things that people do are, if you look at the books, are illegal, but they don't get prosecuted for it. And what that does is kind of embolden people to do, do things beyond the norms and say, hey, they didn't get hit for something that is illegal, like, you know, just jumping into a system and jumping out without access. Wow, that, that means that, you know, I did something illegal and I got away with it, I could do more. Because that's not the kind of stuff we're looking at. So what I want to talk to you about is what we really prosecute versus is what we really don't, and maybe that way clear up some of the myths and some of the legends and go from there. That's what I'll talk about. Brian? I, first of all, I'm not a Fed. I've been uh, just harassed by, I don't know, it's like, do people really think the Feds are going to send some fat, bald guy out here to... Uh, Does he look like a Fed? Uh, yeah, I, I must. I, I don't know. I, I tend to give the Feds a little more credit. Maybe next year they'll pull a double switch and have flood the place with fat bald guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. All right, you know, it wouldn't cost much. Basically, I'm a, I'm a civil uh, practitioner. I am not interested in throwing anyone in jail. I just want your money. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to. Well, yeah, I'm just here to scare the bejesus out of everyone and uh, talk about the civil ramifications of unauthorized computer access and uh, just where I see civil litigation coming from in the next few years and how it uh, will affect newbie hackers, uber hackers, or, or anyone else. Uh, I, I see considerable liability for coming for insurance companies and for uh, insurance companies representing all the new startup internet security consultants and uh, firewall experts. Uh, and, and that's what I'm going to go into after, after the discussion of the criminal matters. Okay, sorry. So, so basically, I'm gonna after we, after we touch the, on the criminal aspects, I'm gonna hit hit you where uh, where your pocketbook is. I'm gonna talk about uh, where you may be may be civilly liable, whether you're a hacker or in the internet security community. All right, let's talk about criminal stuff first. Here's the kind of stuff we do: stealing. Stealing is wrong. Remember, thou shalt not steal. Remember that one? One of, those, one of those commandment things. It's been wrong since we've had civilization. It's been wrong. It always will be wrong. It's wrong today. It'll be wrong tomorrow. Stealing is wrong. We should have been taught that as children. Stealing, taking something that doesn't belong to you, is wrong. And while it could be a lot of fun, I mean, who didn't shoplift when they were a kid? I mean, while it could be a lot of fun and exciting and challenging to take something that doesn't belong to you, it really sucks if you're on the other end of it, particularly if it's something personal to you. So stealing, if you're stealing, if you're out there stealing stuff, then you got a problem with us. I don't care about people rooting around systems for the most part, but when you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's the kind of stuff that pisses people off and what gets, our, gets us going and gets us, we have a very slow, cumbersome process in order to go after people. But when, when one steals, 
then we actually crank it up. You heard the other day talk about a $5,000 limit. Well, that's not true. I don't want to. Um, I don't want you to think that you're safe if you steal less than $5,000. It's actually not true. Um, in the part of the computer crime statute, it's uh, 18 U.S.C. 1030A4, if you happen to care to look. If you break into a computer with intent to defraud, then there is no $5,000 limit. It's a felony right out the bat. It doesn't matter. So stealing credit cards and using them, um, doing anything where you intend to get money from somebody by misrepresenting or by just by sleight of hand is the kind of stuff that gets us annoyed and gets the victim annoyed, more appropriately. And we go ahead and look at people who steal. What else do we take seriously? We take malicious behavior seriously. It is wrong, it has always been wrong, or probably will always be wrong to destroy or damage property that doesn't belong to you. It's just not cool if you're thinking about walking down a street and throwing a rock through somebody's window. I mean, it's the kind of stuff that, gee, that was wrong. And yeah, it's, it's wrong in, this, in, the, in, the, in the physical world, and it's also wrong in the cyber world. What we tend to look at, because we're not terribly smart, is that we look for a physical world counterpart to the kind of behavior that we see in cyber. So that if something is wrong, and you know it to be wrong in the physical world, it's probably going to be wrong in the cyber world, and it's the kind of stuff that you look at. So destroying property is just not a good thing to do. It's just not cool. So as a consequence, when we see that kind of behavior, malicious behavior, that is the kind of thing that once again gets us interested. Now that does have the $5,000 threshold, just to make things perfectly clear. If you do damage, delete, destroy information, and it costs the victim more than $5,000 to repair the damage, then it meets the federal jurisdictional threshold. And it's kind of silly when you think about it, actually. What we're doing is encouraging bad net citizenship. So if you have like a real good, if you're a solid ISP and you get hacked into and a guy takes down a bunch of files and you know, roots around and does a lot of damage and uh, you have to hire a consultant, for example, to go to come in and figure out where the damage was done to patch the holes and, and work up things, you're more than $5,000 right off the bat. And that particular person, you know, can be looking at federal prosecution. If, on the other hand, you are, you're a good ISP, a good net citizen, and you have pretty serious security, and you have sys managers who understand security, who catch the break-in fairly early, and it's somebody, you know, actually consider that the two uh, crackers have the same absolute intent. They just want to do damage. And let's say, for example, they do the absolute same damage. They go in, they get some access, they destroy personal web pages, they steal personal information, they just cause a, a, a ruckus. But this particular second ISP is serious about security, catch the break-in fairly early, have good backups, are able to restore the deleted files quickly, they patch up right away, because usually, uh, it patch, up, patch up right away, and as a consequence it's taken maybe a couple of sysadmins half a day to put back together. What's that cost the company? $1,500 in time? No federal jurisdiction. Zero. So the good net citizen gets no action from us, and the bad net citizen, somebody who doesn't give a wit about security, uh, their case gets looked at by us, which is kind of weird and kind of disturbs any right-thinking person, I think. Maybe not. Oh, we have a question from the audience. If, if from a jurisdictional standpoint, if the victim of the crime is saying, hey, as a practical matter, the prosecution is done where it's easier to prosecute. So in a case where, let's just say someone from New York hacks into a company or hacks into a naval facility in San Diego, not that that's ever happened, um, the most likely site of prosecution would be the place of the victim computer system because it's easier on the victim for the prosecution to occur there. The only time that doesn't really work is with juveniles. Um, the juvenile system doesn't work that well on the federal side. Uh, part of the reason for that is that the computer crimes are not listed as delineated 
juvenile delinquency offenses. So as a consequence, you have to get permission from the local DA to prosecute it federally. Uh, oftentimes that's forthcoming, sometimes not. The problem, the federal system doesn't have any juvenile detention facilities. We're lucky in California, lucky in California, that because we have a very powerful juvenile justice system, that a federal case, a federal juvenile case in California, the federal judges have access to the California Youth Authority sentence so that uh, if appropriate, someone can be sent to prison. Also, we have a pretty good working relationships with our DAs around the state, so we get the juveniles taken care of that way. Are you a lawyer by some chance? Oh, okay. Yeah, whatever you said. <laughs> Sir. Um, my question's about the legality of reverse engineering. A lot of people say uh, on the internet or when you read through uh, different materials that as long as it's for demonstration purposes or that you have this 24 hour window, this potential warning of people out there, that it's legal to present this information for informational purposes. But the use of it or the intent, intended result is often considered illegal. Is this is a real distinction or is this? <laughs> A, a lot of this, a lot of the, did anybody, did anybody hear that question? We talk about reverse engineering and, and the legality of posting. A lot of that will go, a lot of that will run into the civil arena. As a practical matter, I'll just answer this very quickly. On the criminal side, if we get into a situation where we have a battle of the experts, where the prosecution has to call somebody to say, this is something that was, that was created by reverse engineering, and the defense expert can say, well, it was readily apparent, it really didn't have to be reverse engineered, we don't do those cases criminally. You not really looking at a criminal case for the most part in a reverse engineered product, but it does have on the civil arena, it's a lot easier to do. So I'll shift to Brian for on that. Well, the intellectual property uh, aspects of it. I'm not an intellectual property attorney. I know that uh, I know that the guys who do do that work make far more money than I do. But essentially, there there's a question of intent. What was your intent in posting it? Right, and you know, once again, you can you can come out and say, well, my intent was educational purposes. But if if you have a history, if there's evidence of, of uh, intent otherwise, uh, basically, w with the civil in the civil arena, you go before a jury, and your your burden of uh, persuasion is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, it's not. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Preponderance of the evidence is more likely than not. Fifty-one percent to forty-nine, and you know th those are the questions that, uh, when you consider your jury pool and, and your your burden of persuasion, you know, do you want to do you want to really put that question before twelve people who really weren't even smart enough to get out of jury duty? <laughs> and, and you know those, those are those intellectual property questions. I, I'm frankly I'm not prepared to discuss. I don't know. Okay. You know, sir. I, I, I For federal jurisdiction, for the most part, you have to have attacked a protected computer. A protected computer is one that's used in interstate commerce or interstate communications. So what we look to see in a given case, let's just say you send a threat over, over the internet, uh, over you know, an email threat to your next door neighbor. If it happens to pass through, let's just say AOL in Virginia, then there's going to be federal jurisdiction for it. Uh, if it never leaves the state of California, um, or the state of Nevada, if that's where you are, then there could not be federal jurisdiction for that particular offense. If you put a modem pool in a, within a given state, it would make it more difficult for us to establish federal jurisdiction. We'd have to prove that the communications involved actually went outside state lines. If we have a difficult time proving that, we would defer to the locals. So it would likely result in more local prosecution versus federal. <laughs> Sir? Uh, so if a local, so if a local uh, connection to a local ISP within the state 
was rated by the Public Utilities Commission as being an out-of-state call that still does not call the FBI or anybody else that deals with federal issues into prosecuting that case? It doesn't matter what they call it. What we're concerned with is the reality. Okay. Thanks. Wait, wait for the mic. That way we can, because I'm not repeating questions very well. Who determines the um, the damages for the five thousand dollar limit? Because like the New York Times quoted some ridiculous number for being defaced. Uh, can you just make up this number? No, actually, the uh, the law requires that whatever losses that someone incurs as a result of a of a malicious act have to be reasonable. So it's not even what they actually incur. If you make the mistake of paying fifty grand for for somebody that reasonably would charge ten, then odds if there's an argument about that, uh, the argument is is resolved in favor of what is reasonable. Uh, and you actually we actually have to prove up the losses. And so the answer is no. It's not just whatever somebody says it is. We actually have to document it, and we can only use it to the extent that it's reasonable. Which is why there's not a, you know there's not a lot of cases. On, on, well, there are some cases on website defacement. I mean, most people just look at that as graffiti. If it's entertaining, we don't really bother with it. But if, I mean, it's true. But if, if someone, if you take the site down and make the information unaccessible for an extended period of time, that then it becomes malicious. I mean, there's a the line between something that's entertaining and kind of a fun sort of prank to something that's malicious is a continuum. It's one of those things that you know it when you see it, and you all know it when you do it. Um, but the, to answer your question directly is the losses have to be documented and they have to be reasonable. And on the, on the civil side, we run into very difficult problems in proving damages in these kind of cases as well. Um, the, you know, what it comes down to, well, was there, was there uh, trade secrets stolen? What's the value of those trade secrets? Uh, yeah, we copied someone's customer list. We didn't deprive, we didn't take it, we didn't deprive them of it, but if someone takes your customer list and solicits all your customers and your sales go down noticeably, you've, you've been damaged. Uh, there's, there's tremendous problems in proving up damages in these kind of cases, often requiring expert testimony from, uh, from economists and, and you name it, internet security specialist. It's, it's a difficult area. Trade secret theft is really difficult. Primarily, if something is taken while in development, the issue is what's the loss? Is it the cost of development? The product may never meet the, reach the market, so that the, there really isn't an actual loss. It becomes very difficult for us to figure those cases, and there's not a lot of federal cases on it. Sir. Yes, sir. If you guys were uh, IT managers, what steps would you take to educate your corporate attorneys on people you catch hacking internally, you know, like prosecution? You know, that actually enters both of our areas. For, for, from my perspective, that there is an interest in corporations understanding what criminals are doing within their system, if in fact there are criminals within their system. I think it's important for them to know that, and there's an interest, a uh, general societal interest, in rooting out evil, if in fact evil is what, you, is, is what is occurring. But there's a far greater interest for corporations to take a serious look at their security, and, uh, and it's called money, and Brian exactly. will talk about that. I'm, I'm, my job, if I'm defending a corporate, uh, a corporate entity which uh, may be used as a springboard for, for an attack, or a security consultant or a security company who is charged and has taken on the job of preventing such attacks, is uh, not rooting out evil. It is protecting my client from liability. And, you know, the question you asked uh, is, is nebulous and, and really huge. I mean, if you, if you find your, your employees actually participating in uh, cracking activities, I, you have to take a serious look at it. You have to talk about bringing in the authorities. You have to contact your well, insurer. Let me, let me refine that again. Let's say you catch somebody doing something pretty malicious internally, maybe to yourself or someone outside. How do you guys, if you're an IT manager, how would you educate? Because normally your attorneys aren't very smart on anything, really, except for like prosecuting DUI people or whatever. But, but how, do you, how, do you, how do you educate them? What steps would you guys take to educate them on perhaps something, you know, maybe hire a consultant? Was it, were those some of the options that you guys would suggest? Well, is it, is it just crazy question? Or? Well, no. I mean, it's a very, it's a very real, real, real world question, and it, it, it 
depends on a number of factors. If I'm if I'm an in-house counsel representing a corporation and I become aware that my company's computers are being used used for attacks or you know actually employees are being attacked from within we we bring the authorities in right away we bring the authorities in and then we also we do some severe risk analysis and find out uh, to the best of our ability, internal investigation on what's happened, what's the, ex you know, if it's a one-time thing, if it's been going on for months, do some, do some quick damage assessment, contact our insurers, uh, you know, get the ball rolling to protect our, the company's assets, whether it be, uh, you know, springboard liability and whatnot. But definitely, I think, I think you have to bring in the authorities the minute you're aware of second attack. One of the one of the more interesting parts of that, to the extent a company has its assets kept in digital format, I mean they want to be able to protect them. And if somebody steals their trade secret, they want to be able to sue civilly or get the federal authorities interested in prosecuting. Unfortunately, the law defines a trade secret as something that not only is secret, but that the company has taken reasonable measures to protect. If the company does not engage in any security practice, how has it taken reasonable measures to protect its secret? So that's one of the what's one of the easy doors through which corporate management Managers can start understanding that there's a price to be paid for only being worried if the printer is working. Right, and that, that's where I see in the next five years as a, an exploding area of litigation. The reasonableness of the steps taken by the companies to protect the data of uh, computer network, uh, network people to to secure their systems, to prevent them from being used as a springboard, that sort of thing. Because one of the one of the areas I was charged with here was to, you know, basically scare the hell out of the young hackers. And the the bottom line is that it, let's let's assume that there's been an attack, and let's assume we've been able to prove prove damages. Let's say we have five million dollars of actual damages that we can prove in court. I'm not going to get that from t some 20-year-old college kid, you know, m unless he hits the lottery or comes up with a great patent next year. But what I can do is I can go after the uh, the companies uh, that he, he jumped through. I can go after their security consultants uh, who, you know, I, I will sue the kid, and you know why I will sue him is I will sue him basically to use him as a tool to get to the people who have the deep pockets. I will, uh, I will sit him down in deposition, and I will, I will ask him every technique that he used to uh, pull this off, and if I can somehow establish that he used an exploit that was known that uh, they've been talking about here at DEF CON for the last five years that any reasonable security expert should have known about and should have taken steps to prevent, I will be attempting to dip into, in, into their pockets to make my client whole. And I see that. There's not a lot of cases now. I, I've, you hear the scuttlebutt and there's law review articles uh, coming out projecting this as, as the burgeoning area of lit civil litigation in the next few years. And I, I think that's where it's going to go. And I think people, in-house attorneys at uh, the various, you know, security consultants or springboards should be aware of that now. Do you want to say a little uh, bit of it? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Uh, sorry I'm late. I was in the bar and uh, <laughs> I thought <laughs> I thought this was going to be in the room that the CDC thing was on and so since it was on the TV in there I thought oh I don't have to worry until they're done with all of that. So I, I apologize for being so late. But uh, if you guys have any uh, criminal questions you want the defense perspective on, you can direct those towards me. I've already, um, I've already turned them to the good side of the force. <laughs> it is your destiny. That's right. <laughs> um, I have a question about as far as intent goes and things like gray hat hacking and things where you know maliciousness is not always as apparent. Uh, take for example uh, someone who's showing a company, oh, you know. <laughs> Uh, I broke into your system, this is your security holes, this is what I got, this is how you fix it. Um, but they weren't hired by the company and it wasn't so, you know, cut and dry. How do you deal with the not so obvious? 
the, the question of intent in a criminal case is always the most difficult. And you can own, the only way, and the jury is instructed, that the only way that you can make a decision about intent is by looking at the person's, the person's actions, what they said, what they did, both before and after the action that we're looking at. And we have to prove criminal intent. It's important. The situation that you posit is one that there, and there are gray hat hackers who go ahead and scan a system, find a vulnerability. The question comes up once they go ahead and exploit the vulnerability, have they done so with pure motive or is their motive less than pure? If the message they send to the company is, I found a vulnerability in your system and I exploited it, and if you pay me $15,000, I'll repair it for you. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to put it, I'm going to post it. Then we have a situation of, of what we call extortion, right. taking something that doesn't belong to you. Well, and I, it would be extortion. That's I, right. I, I, it's not like that. I want to I want to respond to that because I don't think that's an accurate reflection of oh, what the law go. is. 1030 does not the, the prosecutor is going to give you the gloss on it, but the truth is that 1030 doesn't require maliciousness. 1030 requires knowledge. So regardless of the purity of your motives, if you have knowledge that you're gaining unauthorized access, you can violate uh, the unauthorized access statute, which is 18 U.S.C. 1030. And I have had cases where a uh, security company offered to provide services to a, uh, an internet business, and the uh, system operator of the internet business said, well, they're not, they don't know anything. Their own security is not good. And the security company said, yes, it is. And the system operator broke into their system and stole one of the internet companies company's own proprietary documents that was stored on the security company's server, showed it to his manager and said, look, they're not secure. I stole our own proprietary information off their server like that. And then the manager brought it to the, in to the security company, and then the security company brought it to the FBI. And that's a violation of 1030 because he gained unauthorized access. His motives were pure to protect his company from the uh, mistake of hiring a security company that was full of shit. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, he still had to meet me. So maliciousness is not always an element of the statute. Your motives can be pure and you can still get... If Jennifer hadn't been in the bar and was here when we were talking about this earlier, <laughs> she, would have, she would have heard what I talked about at the beginning about there are things that may be technically illegal and we can debate forever the areas of technical illegality versus real illegality, but the good prosecutors only do the cases where maliciousness is clear, at least to us. And with, with her... That's true. That's absolutely true. There are, there are bad prosecutors as there are well, bad computer system managers. So I'm really clear that the law should not criminalize things that are not prosecutable. The law should clearly say what's going to be illegal and not illegal, and we shouldn't depend upon the good graces and discretion of some prosecutor to just to protect our rights. Your argument is not with me. Your argument is with the Congress of the United States, the representatives of the people here today. If you want to change the law, be my guest. I what I'm trying to do, do so. what we only try and do, is take the worst of the worst off the street. If I prosecuted every single act that's been made illegal by the Congress, I wouldn't be here enjoying your company today. I'd, I'd be too busy. So we're forced, as a result of resource allocation, to only skim the cream. And those of us who do our job responsibly do that. There are others, and we, we both know them. But the reality is, if you're looking at what you can do and what you can't do, if that's what we're here to talk about, if you're, if you're knowingly engaging in malicious activity and you're doing damage, or you're stealing something, you're going to be talking to us. And one, one aspect that, that becomes involved with trade secrets, especially in large corporations, is, is it actually secret or has it been made available to the public? Um, I, I've had a case in the civil arena uh, suing a, uh, an oil company who, should, who will remain nameless, where I was in court jumping up and down trying to get uh, access to some documents. And we had an army of lawyers on the other side basically saying that it would be the end of the world as we know it if, if I was able to get these documents. And essentially, you know, I had the documents in my hand, and I, I got the documents from, from the oil company's website the night before. <laughs> so I was able to tell the judge, you know, the end of the world is here, Your Honor, but I, need, I still need uh, copies of these documents given to me under oath. And the, the, the upshot was it resulted in a $10,000 discovery sh sanction for the oil company. But what happens a lot of times 
is th these companies, the larger the company, the left hand may not know what the right hand is doing. They can be jumping up and down screaming trade secret, secret yet their public relations department has posted the information in a press release six months ago. So, uh, you know, that's an issue that comes up from time to time. To the uh, civil litigator. As a um, someone that's working independently, doing um, security auditing for someone, what steps would you recommend that person take to protect themselves in the event that um, you know, the company gets broken into afterwards? Insurance. Whether you know, as far as, as far as to protect your your assets. Yeah, uh, to, I, you, I you think... can knock off the ETS too. And, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think what you need to do, one, is, is look at your form of business. You may want to go into an LLC, a corporation. Uh, you, want to, you want to get insurance. You want to get E&O coverage. And the amount of coverage you need, I think you need to look at, do a, do a good analysis of your exposure. What, what is the likely exposure or what is the possible exposure that, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to fall your way? Um, and, and go out and spend some money and get, get insurance and talk to an attorney. Talk to an attorney, look at your documents. Some of, some of these things uh, you can contract away with your clients. Uh, you know, because you, you're in a risky business. You, you may be doing everything right and still there may be some evil genius in the back of the room who may crack your firewall even though you did nothing, nothing wrong. He just may have, have tripped on. You, you might not have been negligent, but if there is damage, they're going to look to you. So protect yourself, uh, you know, by maybe changing your form of business, look into E&O coverage, and discuss with your clients a way to uh, maybe, you know, contract out and, de and get an indemnification indemnification clause from them. You may not get it. I wouldn't give it to you, but but they might. Depending on uh, if, if your talents are so critical to their success and they want you, they may be willing to negotiate with you and, and hold you harmless from, from any events. Don't count on it, but it's worth a shot. We've got to pass the mic around so people can hear what's, what's going on. I know you, you want to keep it. Rock out. But. <laughs> Hey, you had mentioned code section, what, I believe, 1300 or 1301, about criminalizing ac unauthorized access. 1030. 1030. 1030, thank you. Um, what does this do in a situation where you've got a company like Yahoo that's uh, checking into deep links at various other websites when those websites specifically don't want that de -link deep linking done? Does that criminalize that behavior also? Generally, I'll just just make it clear. Bus generally, business to business behavior, unless somebody's stealing someone else's property, is not something that we look at. A deep linking. I, I don't. I guess you're talking about a basic or exceeding an authorized access. If it's even if it's even that, we recognize one of the things that's a reality. Even though Jennifer will, will doesn't think it's a good thing, if you simply exceed authorized access or access without authority, a protected computer, and obtain information, and do nothing more than that, that's a misdemeanor. There is almost Almost no federal prosecutor in the country that will willingly accept a misdemeanor case. We just don't do them because we're too damn busy doing other stuff. So if it gives you a comfort level to know that you can access a protected computer, obtain information, and you probably won't get prosecuted, fine. You know, go home with that knowledge and sleep secure. But on the other hand, don't let that embolden you, is my message, to go beyond and enter the felony zone, which is steal stuff or damage stuff, because then we'll be talking to you. I just want to add that there is a case that sort of touches on what I think you're talking about, which is the Bitter's Edge case, in which bit, a company called Bitter's Edge, um, like a like a bidder in an auction, was doing mining of other auction sites and compiling them all so people could see what the best price was on an auction. And eBay then went back and sued them, saying that they had gained unauthorized access to eBay's system by collecting this information and using it in, in their own business. So this is something that we're seeing worked out, not so much in the criminal context for the reasons that my colleague has so uh, excellently stated, but in the civil context Don't try well. and make up now. <laughs> So in that case, there could be civil damages as opposed to criminal prosecution. Right, okay. exactly. We pass the mic back to. 
Yeah, I just have a question of where on the prosecutorial and uh, defense side is counter-strike hacking or hacking back, as we saw recently with the World Trade Organization denial of service attacks, which were reversed and sent right back to uh, the group of hackers, which was malicious, caused damage, but at the same time was simply just a deflection of what they were doing. The problem with, with counterattack is that to the extent that you are sniffing a system that doesn't belong to you in order to keep going up the chain, then you're probably violating the federal wiretap statutes. There are no protections, or there's, there's no exception under the federal wiretap statutes for trespassers. And the federal wiretap statute doesn't only apply to government activity, but it also applies to private activity. So if you can hack back to somebody without sniffing a system that you don't have rights to, then you're probably in violation of federal law. Uh, that would you be prosecuted? The odds are, I would say no, uh, because what you're, yeah, what you're, you know, when we, we wouldn't want to be in a position of trying to explain to a jury why you're a bad person for going back after somebody who did some damage to you. It's the kind of thing we would hope can be worked out in the civil arena, particularly if you violated some federal statutes on the way. So hacking back is not a good idea if you're going to be looking to the government to protect you down the road, and maybe a bad idea if you're otherwise in hot water with the government because of the wiretap laws. It's our favorite statute. People, uh, it's a lot easier to prove a federal wiretap violation than almost anything else that a cracker can do. Most crackers, one of the first things they do is put the sniffer in in order to get other passwords and logins. Um, and that's the kind of thing we don't have to prove much, only that it, it was an interception that occurred. Um, so that's, if there's any other advice I can have you take away from this is don't do that. Can we get this, um, this gentleman and then this gentleman? Okay. Can we do this gentleman? This is Here comes the mic. Okay. Unless you want to talk real, stand up and talk real should, loud. Practice out your, out your out public there. speaking. Bring her up. <laughs> get out there with the people. <laughs> you get brave with the chair. I saw sort of a question about the uh, Department of extent of liability and insurance, and I'm going to use an analogy here. If I leave my car in the red light district with the keys in it running, the door's unlocked, the law's not going to do a whole lot to protect me if I really like, sign on to steal this car. How far is the law going to go to protect systems that are basically set up wide open, a big welcome mat on saying, come on in? You just couldn't help yourself? <laughs> are you, are you going to be able to sell that to the uh, blue-haired old women and retirees that are sitting on that jury? I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, no, I, I think I'd have a better chance of selling them than I'm a male model than, uh, than that story. Well, so, you know, think about it. I mean, you don't have to persuade me because you're paying me. I'll believe you. <laughs> but... But you're going you're gonna to have to persuade the people who are sitting on that jury that, geez, I, I just couldn't help myself. It was, you know, and it's not going to fly. I, it, that argument actually comes up in some of the criminal cases, too, the argument that you didn't exceed authorized access if the system was so poorly configured that, you know, pretty much anybody with some basic skill can walk in. And that gets back to the old concepts of right and wrong. If you know that you're doing wrong, then you probably are. And we can argue all day about what, whether people deserve what happens to them. I mean, just because I forget to lock my apartment one day, does that give a neighbor the right to open the door and take my stereo? I don't think so. I mean, who would say that that's okay? I mean, if I happen to leave my shades open at night and somebody, you know, creeps through the bushes, climbs a tree to take a peek at me in, my, in the nude, I mean, you know, the peeping Tom thing, who thinks that's good? I mean, that, that kind of obtaining information, you know that it's wrong. That's what yeah, I mean, exactly, nobody, but you don't know what you're getting until you peek in the window. You see me, you go, shit, I climbed the tree for nothing. <laughs> that's what Jennifer had the tree cut down outside her house. <laughs> there, there's no trees outside my house. <laughs> That's where we have a cross complaint because both sides are damaged. Yeah. <laughs> the in the hat. Send the mic back to the man with the hat. Let's get the mic. Somebody stole our mic. Oh, sorry. The other guy with the hat. Somebody should play Jerry Springer and kind of roll around. <laughs> Should I do it? Uh, as an extension to the previous question there, um, how does implied access, I mean, if you go to a, a government website, you, you know, it's public, there's no passwords, you are, you generally assume you're allowed to go in, look around, to anything that's linked there. So they're giving you access to certain files within a certain directory structure in the system. 
Now, if on that same box they had an open net BIOS share with no password, there's nothing in the front gate telling you don't enter, but because there's nothing, it's just like your website, you're giving them access. But in this case, it happens to be the entire drive. Um, how does that really differ um, just well, from a legal standpoint? On the civil side, we're basically looking at a, a trespass analysis here. If I invite you in, if I'm a bar owner and I invite you in to come in and have a good time, that's fine. And Jennifer yeah. will be there. Jennifer, Jennifer will be there uh, longer than she should. <laughs> but if you then sit at my bar and reach across the bar and grab my margarita bowl and throw up into it or something, you have exceeded your access <laughs> and your authorization and you have caused me damage. That's a question. <laughs> and, and, and you know, when you're talking about government websites, I, I do a lot of legal research on government websites because they're, they're excellent. But, you know, usually, once again, in, in the civil arena, you're talking about reasonableness. And, and when you're talking about reasonableness, you're talking about what can I persuade a jury with that preponderance of the evidence standard. And it's, it's not that hard. If there are hard cases, those are the ones that get litigated and make law. But we don't have that law right now, but you know. I actually look at what the end result is. If you get access because the system has been so poorly configured, the website is so bad that you get into a, that even into places you shouldn't, and then you just start deleting files. I, at that point, you know, there's no question that you know what you're doing is wrong, and I'm with you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm all over you. If all you've done is look around and go, ha, ha, look at these idiots. Um, I, you know, I don't really, is there, is there a potential federal misdemeanor there? Maybe. Do I care? No. Well, what's the invitation? I mean, if simply by having your system poorly configured is not the same thing as having a welcome sign. It's not, it's not saying steal this car. It's not about the invitation, it's about the action that results from it. That's what he's saying. If you have malicious intent, just because someone's walking around with a tight skirt on doesn't mean you can go out. <laughs> You know, this is a this is an excellent point. I mean, as a practical matter, what I see is that often to prove unauthorized access, all they have to do is they bring in the victim to say, like, I didn't mean he could get in there. And it's you have to understand that, especially I think this is difficult for technical people, that permissions is not the same as permission. Just because it's set up so you can <laughs> doesn't mean that you are allowed, okay? But as a practical matter, the way that law enforcement looks at it is they don't really care, kind of, if you get in. It is sort of what you do after after because that's what captures their so imagination and makes it a, a great case. When does yes mean no? When does what? <laughs> when does yes mean no? <laughs> that's a very funny joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, I, I would say S means no when um, you, what you do in there is something that pisses off the prosecutor. And I had a case just like this where a web server was running this old buggy software that displayed the master password file. And it wasn't so much that the guy got the master password file that pissed off my prosecutor. What it was that he ran crack against it and then printed the de-encrypted version on IRC. That's what she got mad at. So, you know, it's a, it's some, sometimes it's the thing that happens after the fact that really gets you in the hot water. Trafficking in passwords is a federal offense. It's 10, not 29. There was a guy over there who had a question. Hi. Uh, what kind of arrangements are made with the uh, United States and Canada if a Canadian citizen uh, breaks a law in the United States concerning uh, system penetration? Hypothetically? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm retired. Hypothetically, eh? Okay. <laughs> As you know, we, we're, I'm not in, in, I cannot talk about any pending cases, and, uh, and of course my responses are my own and not the official response of the United States Department of Justice. Nevertheless, <laughs> there are a number of ways that we deal with uh, international events. Canada is, is actually an easy example because we have, a, uh, we have a treaty with Canada that allows for mutual legal assistance. We have an extradition treaty with Canada that is actually used fairly extensively. Um, we share some culture with uh, Canada so that we have an easier time talking to each other about matters of import. We have the ability and have regularly provided Canadians lawfully with information that we've obtained that they've used to prosecute their own citizens. Uh, so Canada is, a, is an easy example. There are countries, however, in which the, uh, it's much more difficult, even with, even with treaties, to gain the type of cooperation that we want where there's been international destructive behavior. 
Could you address that same issue from the opposite if, if the Americans just then? <laughs> it's actually the same when we have these treaties, like with Canada. China we do not have an extradition treaty with, so if an American citizen uh, hacking from their own room uh, breaks into a Chinese uh, computer system and causes all kinds of damage, it would create some international diplomatic discussions, but the American would be, in, uh, it would be uh, completely free from prosecution unless they happen to uh, travel to, to, to China or a country familiar with China, or a country uh, friendly with China. Now, if China hacked back, now, now that, then we get into some very interesting situations. Does China hack back as the government of China, or does it hack back as an individual who was hacked? Once you know, we get into areas of, of warfare, of, in, of informational warfare, and suddenly we've gone from a very simple, hey, I got into a, you know, I got into a China system, cool. Next thing you know, we, uh, we have the Chinese government responding. Um, it's almost like a movie. And the answer to it is, is one that, would, would the American ultimately get prosecuted? Probably not, because the Chinese government probably would not give us enough information to mount a successful prosecution. If they did, would we prosecute? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, would we send it to China for, for prison? For, no, just for re-education. <laughs> I had a question on uh, due diligence on the uh, on the places that have, are the jump point. Uh, you talked about civil litigation there. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of matrix or guide do you have to go by to show that they haven't performed due diligence? Well, this is a tricky. Where is that established at? Well, we're t you're talking about you're talking about a negligence standard, and a negligence standard you you have to have a duty. There has to be a breach of that duty and, and damage. Uh, there's absolutely, the case law on this doesn't exist. It's, it's basically what, what you have with the civil, the civil field is it, it, legislatures, it's not sexy to pass uh, civil, civil laws, that, you know, civil penalties. You can't go out and get reelected saying I'm tough on uh, torts. Uh, so what, what you have here is you have basically the common law developing through the courts and you have the courts trying to jam technology issues that evolve daily into pigeonholed tort theories that go back to Blackstone, you know, go back a hundred years. Right now we have cases uh, about unauthorized access, uh, basically trespass to chattel cases, uh, the the eBay uh, eBay case Jennifer discussed earlier that that's kind of a trespass analysis. Uh, there's a misrepresentation analysis that goes on with regard to uh, uh, you know using uh, uh, pass codes. Basically, you're representing that you're the uh, you're the rightful owner of that pass code, and the machine is is seen as the agent of the. Uh, of the victim accepting the passcodes as as being genuine. There's some real strained analysis going on here. With regard to the jump point analysis, you're looking at a, a negligence. You're basically, the analysis would be, did I, was I reasonable in the efforts that I took to protect the system from this kind of event happening? And the evidence that you would put on is, well, we've, you know, we came to DEFCON and hired the best, the best security guy I could find at the bar. You, know, you, you, you have to sit there and you're going to have to show that you took reasonable steps to secure your system. And you know, if if you if you have security consultants or in-house people who keep up to date on the latest exploits, and you can document that, you can show that they've gone to conferences. We have a, we have training programs. We've done this. We've done everything we can. You know, you've made a strong case for for not being negligent. Because like I, like I said before, you may do everything you can, but there may just be someone out there smarter than you, and you're not negligent. But, you know, in the end analysis, it comes down to, uh, you know, convincing a jury or, you know, settling a case if you don't want bad publicity. So. Let's go back. Have you ever felt like uh, I'd be responsible for, uh, let's say, a client of theirs you know, being in a temporal point of view? I've been on the other, <laughs> I've been on the other side of that one. Uh, no, I, I've done, like I say, this is a developing area of the law. 
uh, my background, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of consulting and and basically uh, uh, similar similar type areas. Uh, going, I've you know I've gone into uh, auto body shops and give, given speeches on uh, sexual harassment and why you can't post the hustler centerfold up on the wall. You know, it's a, it's a similar type analysis with what you have now. It's, you know, you, you'd be, you'd be surprised. But it's a similar type analysis to what, what's going on now. You, you, you basically have to take the analysis that I, I just described and say, well, you know, we've entered into contracts. You also have to worry about, you know, what have I represented to my clients that I can do? You may have a fraud misrepresentation claim coming your way if you've puffed and huffed and puffed and built yourself up to uh, say you can do more than you can do. See, I'm, I'm going to need a translator for that. I, <laughs> okay. Well, see, that that's a case where I think you have to in, in your in your contract. If you're you you've got to disclose, make a full disclosure of exactly what you're selling them. If you're if you're telling them that. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you a, a system that uh, we're monitoring and we're doing this and that, and you're not providing that. You've, you've basically defrauded your client. Uh, if you tell them, here, here's what you're getting, it's as is, uh, it may be good enough, may not, you buy it at your own risk, and you can get somebody to sign off on that, good for you. you know. <laughs> That's one of the other things, aside from stealing, lying has always been wrong, will always be wrong. So if you lie to somebody to steal their money, or lie to somebody to get them to give you their money voluntarily, that's also the kind of thing that interests us, because it's simple and we're not that smart. Put this gentleman right here, and then go back over there. <laughs> Yes. We have to prove that the evidence that we're using is authentic. And there are ways to do that. One of the, one of the, that's why it's important. One of the things that we went back to earlier is if a company or a victim gets law enforcement involved early, then one of the things that we can do is secure a system and secure the logs, so at least at the point we have them, we know they're genuine. The issue as to whether they're genuine when we come in is a difficult one, and one we have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. We have been successful 100% of the time in getting logs in. Uh, we, have not, we have overcome several challenges of, because it's digital, it's ephemeral, and it could be changed and modified, and then you get to look at who these people are and what's their motivation. What is your motivation in faking, in faking these logs and bringing your system down and costing your sell $15,000. Are you that vengeful? Um, so as a practical matter, it's not a real issue for us, although it comes up in every case. Oh, here we go. Start over. Thank you. Uh, many of the things come down to with that 1030 with uh, authorization and the ability to grant access. If a person is on like pound hack and they say, I own this box. Here, have an account and a password. They're committing fraud in one way, but they're also using the form of communication that is common in the culture on that channel. How will that affect a case where a person that didn't break into the box is now using that box and doing their own work and deleting files? Again, it's the use of the box is not something that generally concerns me. I mean, it, it may be some unauthorized access there, but I don't care. We look at the result. If after you get access to the box, whether you've got it because you've been lied to or got it legitimately or got it illegitimately, once you start doing damage to the box, and we look at why, what it is that, what kind of damage you caused, whether you did it intentionally, recklessly, or negligently. Um, that's when we start looking at it. We look at the conduct after the fact. The mere fact of illegal access, while it is an offense, is not the kind of thing that gets us going. Okay, if, if a person who sit, claims to own the box gives you access and says, go ahead and trash it, and you do, the easy answer for me is that the person who comes in, if they, if they reasonably believe that person had the, had owned, did own the box and gave them permission, they lacked criminal intent, and there would not be a criminal case. Okay, officially we're out of time, but the next speaker says we can keep with questions for a few more minutes. 
And by the way, I just got an announcement they have finally fixed the air conditioning. Once it exceeds five thousand dollars, that's it's right in the statute. And like we talked about how to get there, it has to be reasonable. Um, but once you once you exceed five thousand dollars in costs of repair and costs of analysis, then there's federal jurisdiction if the computer was a federally protected computer. Say again. The question is, do, does every case in which the damage exceeds $5,000 get investigated? The question is, it depends where it occurs. In some federal districts, the, uh, the resources are such that the, federal, the guidelines before which the case will be investigated or prosecuted gets ratcheted up. In some districts, like mine, if you exceed $5,000, I'm looking at it. Um, so stay out of San Diego. <laughs> The fellow in the glasses right there. If, if someone breaks into your box and then proceeds to install an IRC client and use it, are there any legal problems with logging all of their actions and communications that originate from your box that they've broken into? Jennifer talked about that yesterday. As a sys manager, you have the right to monitor, use, and disclose to protect yourself and protect the, you know, the rights that you have in the system. So you can monitor to your heart's content. That's, you know, that's not an issue for me. And I'm allowed, to some extent, to surf behind you. Uh, if you're a sys manager, and you're monitoring, using, and disclosing to protect yourself, I'm allowed to use that information so long as you're acting in your best interest and not in the interest of the government. Once your interests shift and the reason you're monitoring and disclosing is to get somebody prosecuted and not to protect yourself, the interests have changed and I'm required to get a wiretap order unless your system is bannered. That is, that anybody who enters your system sees something that says you have no right to privacy in this system, we're going to monitor, use, and disclose to our heart's content, beware then I can, as a prosecutor, I can use everything that the sys manager does in logging. And th this goes back to the question that was asked earlier from the civil side. If, if you're aware of this kind of activity, what do you do? Y you want to document that activity for your purposes, you know, as well as, as for law enforcement purposes. You want to have uh, the ability to, to preserve evidence that you may use in a suit against someone else or uh, may be used against you. You, you want to have that, talk to your in-house counsel or your, your lawyer and, and notify the authorities and, and preserve that evidence for your own purposes. Okay, here's another scenario. Um, a distributed denial of service tool is used to take an e-tailer offline for an hour. That e-tailer generates $5,000 worth of income every hour they're online. Is that a prosecutable case if you can identify the source of the dial of service? If you can identify, well, when you say the source, you mean the, the person who triggered the Yeah, the person who triggered it. Absolutely. Love okay. to do it. <laughs> Just curious, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Can use of bandwidth be used as a damage tool? Probably not. What we do, one of the ways that you can get federal jurisdiction is if you enter a system without authority, exceed authorized access, and steal computer time. And if that time exceeds $1,000, um, then we have the ability to prosecute. But mere bandwidth, mere use of bandwidth, I don't know how you put a, you can put a monetary use on it. The denial of service cases are easy because if you've shut down an e-commerce site, they can actually count or extrapolate what they've lost. If all you've done is steal some bandwidth, for the most part, um, Mr. Napster, then, uh, then it's not the kind of thing that we'd be looking at unless there's some other intentional damage going on. How do you value time? Oh, there's a lot of companies. You know, some of the some of their computer centers actually bill their departments for use of some of their mainframes, and we would just use those figures oh, to, no. to determine the loss. Um, and yeah, providers charge for bandwidth as well. We would use we would use their costs. Ed, back here. Um, it's my understanding that existing Supreme Court case law limits the. Uh, 
will actually cause unconstitutional statutes which are so vague and give prosecutors so much uh, discretion in the prosecution that a potential offender would not necessarily know if they were subject to prosecution. How does that, how does that jibe with the amount of, of discretion you're saying that you have when you're choosing who to prosecute? Well, the courts have also recognized that prosecutors can decide what to prosecute and what not. There's a, there's a difference between prosecutorial discretion and whether the law is so vague that you don't know what you're doing is illegal. The law is actually pretty clear. It, it, there, we can debate what is unauthorized access and when it's and what the permissions mean in that regard. But unauthorized access, if you're in a system that you know you don't have rights to, it, it's pretty easy. Now, I can decide as a prosecutor what the appropriate use of my resources are in order to investigate and prosecute. That's something firmly committed to the executive branch, and it doesn't raise the same issue. We can argue about whether I exercise my discretion appropriately, but as a practical matter, that they're two separate ideas. I think we're just about out of time now, since uh, people have filtered into the room for uh, the next talk. So, uh, any final thoughts and such? And um, I guess some vitamin follow you to the bar or something. <laughs> I'll buy Jennifer her first drink after this session. That, that won't. <laughs> thank Jennifer you. Jennifer is a fun drunk. Thank you, but that won't be my first. <laughs>